actually, I'm going to talk sort of about portability in the context of performance, um, which is to say, I'm unlike the next group, I'm not going to tell you how to write fast code. I'm just going to tell you how to end up not writing slow code, I hope. But also talk about r what I see is, I mean, in my day job is, is a lot of serious portability challenges in the HPC space. So this is my, uh, my whimsical start. So, um, so you probably all read about this, right? This guy who outsources jobs. So I'm going to make a very, very trivial statement, but one which you should like write on your wall, um, tattoo on your forehead, something significant so you never forget it, which is that um, the, the, ess the essence of portable performance is, is to use libraries. I mean, that's a no-brainer, but, but I, I, every once in a while I travel around and I hear stories about physicists who write matrix multiplication with triple loops and have not heard about blahs. And that's, I mean, just go, just stop, just quit your job because you just wasted a thousand fold performance increase just by linking instead of writing code. So, and, and there's libraries, frameworks, all sorts of things. What, if it exists, please use it. I mean, there's, there's basically no reason to roll your own unless something doesn't exist. I, I can't emphasize this enough. Software monoliths, like a lot of application codes that I deal with in chemistry, there are huge barriers to performance and portability. People just build this mega package and they have, you know, one binary that's 150 megabytes and does everything that the world would ever want you to do. And that's not really, it's sort of an all or nothing affair. It's, it's, it, it's sort of, you know, too big to fail bank type thing. And the, it's much better to compose applications, throw away applications out of libraries if you can do it. When in doubt, you know, there's a library for that. If there isn't a library, you should write one and write a library. Don't just, you know, jam, jam some little band-aid into your code and say, hey, problem solved, because you'll come back to that code over and over and over again. Figure out what your problem is, actually solve it the right way with a library, even if it's a little shim library, but make it a real thing, and then put it on GitHub or whatever and share it, share it with people so that no one else has to suffer anymore. Um, there's a lot of examples of people just saying, it's one of the case studies I'll talk about, uh, Elemental, the developer of Elemental just needed for his, just for his test code needed a command line argument parser that sort of wasn't terrible um, and wasn't, didn't you know, require everything to be in order and stuff like that. And he wrote one and it was like 230 lines of code but it actually was cleaner and, and more effective than a lot of basically everything he could find online that he could use in part because of the licensing issues. I would argue you always want to trade performance for portability. I mean, unless you're going to make make up a huge win, like you know, go all in with CUDA and Nvidia puts you on the cover of their web page and gives you free hardware, that might be worth selling out. But in general, your code will outlive the machine. So the most successful supercomputers make it just over five years. The most uh, successful scientific applications may, in my lifetime, actually reach five decades. I mean, there's quantum chemistry codes that. Um, are 40 years old, and they are still widely used and beloved. Uh, so, we're, so five years, five decades, you want to be portable, and mitigate risk. So, um, if you have non, if you have to be non-portable, stick it inside of something which is portable, and so that you you can instantiate that non-portability, and 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 you know, it's sort of like a virtual machine, right? If somebody says hey, can you help me with my code? And you're like, I don't know who this person is, and I don't know if they're going to RM minus RF my home directory. You know, you run it in your VM, and then if your VM catches on fire, you just click, and then you're done, and your computer's safe. So try to, you know, draw, draw a firewall around the problems you might have with portability. This is actually my favorite quote in all of, in all of computing. Um, it's, it's really essential. So John Oosterhout is an, uh, the guy who developed the Tickle language, TCL. It's a, uh, NAMDI has a Tickle inner uh, runtime part of it in uh, it's a sort of HPC use that I know about. It says, the best performance improvement is the transition from the non-working state to the working state. Okay? Gordon Bell Prizes happen like years after you achieve, you know, the Oosterhout Prize of your code actually runs correctly. Um, this is why you trade performance for portability, because if your code doesn't run, you, you're zero on the performance all the way across the board. So Oosterhout, so there's, you know, somebody probably talked about weak scaling or strong scaling, you already know about it. So those are sort of associated with Gustafsson and Amdahl. So I talk about Gustafsson and Amdahl scaling. Well, Oosterhout scaling is, is a Boolean, and your scaling goes from zero to one when your code starts working. And that's the most important scaling you could possibly have. And it sometimes varies with the number of processes, because sometimes you find, you know, you run on 147 processes and your job crashes. I know Petsy has stuff like that. NWChem has a problem with sometimes it starts seg faulting as the number of processes increases, and so that's sort of a bad, 
a bad Oosterhout scale in my book. I'm going to talk about portable MPI communication. MPI is portable, right? So what does it mean to be portable MPI? So I picked Rusty. Um, it, you know, it's nice that he's here so he can, he can beat me up in the parking lot for, for doing this. But also, it worked a lot better to integrate Rusty's beard into Charlton Heston's here. So the MPI standard is sort of, you know, like the Ten Commandments. It, you know, it's, it's perfect. It's from on high. I say that as an unbiased member of the M MPI forum. But implementations are not perfect. So um, people do bad things. So, and hardware does does awful things and you can't tell the hardware to behave where you can tell programmers to behave. So what are things we have to deal with even in the ultra portable world of MPI? We have to worry about do you have the latest features? Are those features broken? Do you have performance quirks that feel like a bug even though your Ooster app performance is great all of a sudden your performance curves jump all over the place and life makes no sense. And then every once in a while there's an ambiguity in the standard which people exploit in different ways and, and this bothers application people like myself. So there's a piece of the MPI standard that I asked that they deleted, that they delete in 3.1 because it said, there's an ambiguity here, but application people don't care. And I said, I care a great deal and this makes me mad, so that's not true. So they, they nicely removed it. So, so I, I'm gonna argue for wrapping MPI, even if it's an absolute trivial wrap. It, it costs you, you know, a few cycles if you have to push the stack pointer, but, but I'll talk about some, some of the payoffs. So, Here's, a, here's just a simple example. So this is a bug in MPI. It's, it happened on BlueGene, and it happened because they wanted to optimize synchronous send by using Rendezvous Protocol. But Rendezvous Protocol is actually tends to be implemented for larger messages. So they didn't have an exception in the code path to say zero byte rendezvous. So they would seg fault because they just said there's no way anybody would ever hit this zero byte rendezvous path. And if you don't know what rendezvous and eager are, I, I don't have time to cover it, I'm sorry. Um, you can ask me about it after we're done. Yeah, you know, we found this bug. I knew it was there. I went and they found it. They sent me the code, and and I fixed it in a you know Sunday afternoon. It took me about two hours because I had to replace you know search through the entire code and replace it 27 times. This we had to do this, and you say, oh, it's just a bug. You just wait for them to fix it. Well, the the people who run this Greens function Monte Carlo code, they're 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 serious. Uh, they don't they're not willing to wait one day without the machine. They want to be running Monte Carlo, um, you know. 100,000 cores all the time, 24/7, as much as they can, and so having, you know, being able to just sort of go in. If I, I would have been nice if I, if they'd wrapped MPI I send, I could have just fixed this once instead of 27. So 27 times is no big deal. But there are application codes that just inline their MPI, you know, hundreds and hundreds of calls. So if you find some bug, well, then you'll have to go in and search and replace 100,000 different calls to MPI send or whatever it is. So here's here's a here's a more fun one. So this is hairy, but this is ab this is absolutely real. So this is, I would like to do reduce scatter block. So reduce scatter block is a collective, you do a reduction and then you scatter um, the result and that's, it's really useful in matrix computations. So reduce scatter was in MPI 2.1 and it was sort of a, a naming mistake. It should have been reduce scatter and reduce scatter V, but they didn't think about reduce scatter so they put reduce scatter V in as reduce scatter and then later they added reduce scatter block to be reduce scatter. So this has to do with vector arguments. So you can look at the details, but the, the short answer is that if you use reduce scatter, you have to have a vector argument and vector arguments of length n proc. So if you do com world and you have 3 million MPI ranks, you're talking about uh, a whole lot of megabytes of input arguments that you don't need if they're all the same. So there's a couple other things going on here. The other one, MPI3 introduced const on read-only arguments. So I have my compiler set to ultra whiny mode and if I do things like pass const and non-const interchangeably, the compiler whines at me, and I don't like that. So I might have to if def and say if it's MPI three, and I know the primitive is declared with a const, I have to actually put in this put it put a const cast in there. Then there's this other thing, which is even more nefarious, and this is the type of thing that you show up shows up a lot in HPC, which is BlueGene has a magical network, and one of the features of that magical network is all reduce is blazingly fast because we asked them for it. As a consequence of sociology and economics, which I don't really want to get into, all reduce is faster than reduce. And that doesn't make sense, okay? That's no, it's not a valid self-consistent performance thing if you've read the paper by the MPitch guys. There's no good reason for that, and you can, you can look at it two ways. You can either say, man, that really annoys me that I have to think about reduce and all reduce, or you could just say, man, I paid $100 million for a machine, and it does all reduce super fast. So. It turns out, so Elemental, this code I'll talk about later, 
hits on reduced scatter, and, and we had an intern, a um, very smart guy, who was like, yeah, reduced scatter is really slow. So I ran some tests, thought about it for a while, I said, interesting, all reduce is faster than reduce, and reduce scatter is implemented as reduce plus scatter. So the scatter part of that can be implemented as a single mem copy. So you basically say, oh, I'll do reduce scatter by just all reducing the whole matrix, assuming I can overwrite the buffer on all the ranks, which you can't assume in reduce scatter without adding an extra buffer. And then instead of just scattering out of that thing, I could just say, well, everybody's got the data, I'll just copy out the bits I need. So this was a performance hack we put in, and it makes a difference. Um, but I put this in here because this is the complexity. If you want to adapt to multiple versions of the MPI standard, you want all the way from just adapting to 2.1, 2.2, 3.0. And if you're at scale and you don't want to use scatter V style arguments, you actually would trade performance in theory for memory use, so space time trade off by doing a reduce and a scatter, which will save the amount of buffers you need to have laying around. The other one, so it turns out that on BGQ and BGQ alone, not BGP or BGL, if you barrier before all reduce, it runs a lot faster. So this is actually quite common. There's papers written on, on it. Um, I was unsuccessful as part of a team of people for Gordon Bell where my only contribution was to figure this out on BGQ. But they had figured it out on InfiniBand. So basically there's, this, there's something called jitter. If, if you don't know, there's papers on it. It's just noise in the machine. And if you have noise, in, all reduce tends to behave badly on, B, uh, on any machine. But on BGL and BGP, the tree network, which did the all reduce, was actually blocking in hardware. So you wouldn't start until everyone was there anyways. So you didn't need a barrier because there was just an implicit barrier in the implementation. But on BGQ, we don't have a tree network. We've got this embedded collective logic. So now we actually don't have an automatic barrier happening. And it turns out that you get these unexpected packet arrivals when you've got processes li arriving late. And, and it sort of clogs up the network. So this right here, if I was going to write, you know, Jeff's reduce scatter block, this is the implementation. And it's obviously not just a simple wrapper because it has to adapt to all this stuff. So the, the other thing you might want to do, so those of you, I don't know if they talked about it, uh, but they deleted the C++ bindings. They're not just deprecated, they're deleted. Doesn't mean they'll go away, but it means there is no definition of MPI3 functions in C++. Uh, you just use the C bindings. So part of the reason they did that is the C++ bindings were arguably useless. There's basically no syntactic benefit relative to the C bindings other than you replace an underscore with a double colon. And that's not really deemed to be a, a productivity enhancer. A lot of people who write C++ know that there are cool things you can do with C++ like type inference. You could just say, oh, I know that this buffer is this type. Why should I have to tell MPI that it's doubles? I already passed it doubles. I've told it what it needs to know. So this is from Elemental. This is a, is a, I would, my slides will be online. They're already on Bitbucket. You should look up this code and read it. It's really elegant stuff. So what Jack does in Elemental is he has this MPI map thing, which is a really neat thing that I would recommend everybody who's a C++ nerd do. Basically, you just do type inference from the buffer, and then he statically instantiates all the templates for all the MPI types. And so he could just punch in send, in a buffer agnostic way, and it'll, it'll obviously get the right one. And he does this for all the, all the MPI ops he uses. It reduce everything. And he can work, and in that code as well, he's got a reduce scatter workaround that I gave him. Uh, he's got workarounds for the pre all the way back to MPI 1.2 or 1.1 when there wasn't even thread functions and things like that. He's got workarounds for other missing pieces and misbehavior in certain implementations of MPI for complex numbers. So he's got all these workarounds all encapsulated in one file. There's only one file in the entire library that calls MPI, and it's MPI C++, CPP, and then all the, the MPI namespace inside of Elemental captures all the nice features that he wants and deals with all the, the, the hairy details. This is the reason you, you wrap MPI. Um, I mean, you want to work around bugs, work around performance quirks, as I've described, deal with different, different versions of MPI because it's not a monolith. And then I think, I think this one is, is one that I don't think, I don't know how many of you are pure C or pure F77 programmers. If you're pure C, hooray, I'm proud of you. Um, if you're pure F77, you should probably um, enter the 21st century. But if you're a Fortran person who's living in the 21st century, 2003, 2008, so there's Fortran 2008 bindings in MPI 3. They're sort of not yet fully available as far as I could tell. Um, I'm not aware of any support for them, although it's very active. 
But if you're doing Fortran 2003, there's the only MPI bindings you have are the F90 ones, and the F90 ones aren't very good for F203. So I've actually seen code that do this. You write your own MPI binding, so you, so you, you, and you do whatever you want to have out of Fortran, object-oriented features or whatnot, um, and then you wrap the C bindings, and that's pretty easy to do. So, so here, you're writing your own bindings, and in the process, you get your own wrappers, and thus you can do all the stuff. You might want to do your own performance instrumentation. There's obviously great tools people are going to talk about next week. I think Al Maloney's coming in to talk about Tau. But if you just want a really thin layer, and you just want to say, how many times do I call send in this part of my code? And y you could do that and get, get some, and you could just do that by saying you count the sends in one place. You don't go in and, r and go, find every instance of MPI send and add a line of code before and after it, which is just horrible. And then the other thing you might do is you might, you might find that for whatever reason, when you run in certain problem parameters, your code hangs. Well, it could be you've used MPI incorrectly and you're making an unsafe assumption about buffering. Um, so this is a trick, it's discussed in the standard. I know, I know Bill and Rusty have, I think, talked about it in other talks that I've seen of theirs. But if you replace send with S send, you sort of, you basically say, no, don't actually send until you uh, make a rendezvous point, and therefore, if you are making an unsafe assumption about eager protocol, this will hang you, and therefore, but you can debug this in an, because you will see it much more clearly, and you'll see it at all scales, and not just when you, of course, run into the, the rendezvous regime. I want to make it very clear, in part because I work with people who will beat me up in the parking lot if I say you shouldn't use MPI. But there, are, every once in a while, there comes along something that that uh, is better than MPI, while compromising all notions of portability. So Cray and BlueJean, for example, have very specific communication layers, and sometimes they actually provide really cool features. But they're not portable, and there's a reason they're mapped specifically to hardware. So one of the things you can do is, if you have a specific use case, one-sided being one of something near and dear to my heart and, and probably a good use case here. If you have one-sided programming model and you're using MPI, which you should be doing so you're uber portable, but then you say, oh, I'm on a, I'm on a very expensive machine with this other interface, you could go in and say, if def, fancy machine, use fancy API, else if, use MPI. And, that, and then you can localize that and you can switch back and forth. And I think, I think for the most part, MPI 3 makes this unnecessary because all the, the cool stuff like non-blocking collectives and atomics are now in MPI 3. But on BlueJean, we don't have MPI 3 yet, so maybe you do this there. The other thing is, pretty much going bare metal is, is always going to win in terms of performance just be, when you're latency sensitive. So if you, if, you, if you really care about like 200 cycles of latency, you care about software overhead. And therefore, cutting out any sort of you know, API abstraction might help you. So if you're super, super latency sensitive, you want to maybe have a hook to, to, to replace something in MPI with some ultra low latency hardware aware call that only works on one machine. But again, booster out performance is key and unless this really, really matters, I wouldn't bother with it. So just for sort of comparison, so this is, I'm terrible with Microsoft Office products. This is open office, I guess, so this is ugly, but sorry, the font's too small. But so this green line here is uh, non-blocking ready send, which is the best sort of approximation to one-sided. And if you, these are PAMI calls, so these are all non-portable stuff. It looks about the same. It's harder to use because the documentation's lacking. But you see here, it's actually a decent performance hit. Now, you, you, that's not MPI's fault. In, in, it's not like you can improve it in the, in the sense that send receive has a particular semantic that says send receive behave this way, and they behave this way for a reason. But if you don't need that, you can break the rules but you can't break the rules with MPI, you can break the rules by going to PAMI and saying, oh, I've pre-allocated all my buffers and I know what target address I'm sh sending to with my send rather, rather than waiting for a receive to be posted. And that's where you win in the small message regime. The bandwidth, of course, peaks out at the same thing, but in this, in this modest message regime, regime, you know, kilobytes, you get a huge win. So if you're the kind of person who can replace in a, in a, in a, re in a sort of localized way MPI with something else, you can get a performance win from this. I, I found this a couple years ago. To me, this is just hilarious. So if you know this, you know this home page, you know institution that is? SNS.IAS.edu. Who's the most famous employee of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton? So these are ridiculously smart people, but they don't know jack about MPI. So the re and this guy is like National Academy of Sciences longer than I've been alive, and he's certainly not stupid. He's just programming MPI an old-fashioned way. But I just threw this up here like, this is maybe why you have to ignore your, ignore your thesis advisor once in a while. 
uh, he wants you to put all your MPI calls in main if you're using subroutines. So he's suggesting that it's actually okay to write scientific code in a single procedure called main or program inside. Anyways, it's just hilarious. So don't do this. This is, this is the wrong thing to do. A little bit on performance, more on the quirky side of things. So this is BGQ. Uh, it's a pretty easy test to write. Bob's at, Bob has a much better picture than I do, and much cleaner data, so I used his. Bob Walkup's the BG, IBM for Blue Gene Performance Guru. So what is this? So this is Blue Gene Q. I don't know if you've, how much hardware background you got from Ray Loy or anybody else. It's got a lot of outbound links. It's a five-dimensional torus. It's got two, it's got a bidirectional link in every, every direction. So you can hit all the links at once. So the nice thing about this is you can, you can continue saturating links as you use them. So if you're doing 3D boundary exchange, if you have 3D physics, you can use all three dimensions of the network at the same time. You don't have to take turns. Well, it turns out other machines, I'll try not to beat up on any other vendors, but you can just process a donation. They're not BlueGene. They don't let you do this. And sometimes they even give you worse performance when you drop all your Halo Exchange non-blocking into the network and wait all actually you know, wants you to take turns and go exchange with X, exchange with Y, exchange with Z. And so th this is, of course, a performance quirk, and it's another reason to localize. Because if you localize that part, you can say if def blue gene else, and you can, you can deal with this, this behavior. But this is a reason to, to try and you know, understand the hardware a little bit when designing your MPI, because even though MPI is portable, the performance may not be. This is one that drives people nuts. Um, this is blue gene Q. This is all reduce and reduce, which I already told you behave totally counterintuitively. And this is showing integers and doubles. So integers and doubles are not the same size, so don't try to compare them directly. But this, the, the highest bandwidth is all reduce double. Okay, that's, that's not, you know, if I'd taken a poll and you guys had you know, weighed in, the larger data type with floating point arithmetic reductions that goes to all targets is not the candidate that's likely to be the fast one. The other thing is you see, well, this thing bounces all around, so basically you have some protocol switch that goes from here, switches to a different protocol, switches back. Wouldn't be surprised if this is just a bug and we should make them fix it, um, but nobody is complaining to me about all reduce integer performance, so I'm not bothering to deal with it. We see that reduce, if the reduce basically behaves boringly. Reduce has the same curve, for integers and doubles. So this, and this is the type of thing you actually want to have. If you have application behavior that depends heavily on specific MPI calls like these, you want to have unit tests to understand your MPI before you go try and go off and tune your app. Uh, so I actually, it's, it's on Google Code. I'll put a link up on the slides. I'll edit them after this. It's, it's called MPI Quality of Implementation Tests on Google Code. And it's, it just includes my collective benchmark that I use for acceptance testing on the, the 48 rack blue gene, and it basically just abuses collectives. Uh, it does all sorts of things that don't really need to happen, but are ways of basically making sure that the MPI doesn't have holes in it. Um, and, and you know, it's, it's, I would say it's homework. Maybe you could run it on another machine and tell me what the results are. I'm not going to tell you which machines these are because I'll leave it as homework. You run, run a, write an all gather, or write a gather test. So I, counts here is wrong, it's, it's, it's nproc times count. So this is a total number of bytes that are moving to the root, not, so count in gather is how many bytes from each rank come out and then go to the root. So this is gather as a function of message size as a bandwidth. And the reason this is, of course, I think really important is how many people run their application with only one problem size ever? Okay, that's what I thought. I picked a good question so no one has to pay attention and raise their hands to answer correctly. So if you're weak scaling, you might actually have your problem cross over one of these bumps. And you might say, oh, this is interesting. Well, if you're here and then you run a slightly larger problem, you might say, oh, now it's going to go a whole lot slower because you hit some protocol bump. And I, I'm I know that this is basically an eager rendezvous cutoff effect. They should do a better job. They should fix it. This is basically just a different type of effect where basically they're not able to get good latency in small messages. But this is the type of thing in terms of understanding the performance of your apps at scale and on different machines, you should have some understanding of the fact that all those ideal bandwidth curves that are just sigmoidal or, or I mean, if they're log-log, they're basically a, you know, look like a trapezoid. Those are, all, those are all fiction. They're useful fiction, 
but, but this is reality and this is, and this is unpleasant to, to try and deal with. So not all networks saturate at the same rate. 3D Taurus on BGP and 3D Taurus on Cray XE do not behave at all the same. Uh, one of them is basically just a random mesh that happens to have a 3D Taurus as the backbone, whereas BG is electrically isolated Taurus, but Cray has pass-through pass bandwidth, so you can actually deal with contention better. BG doesn't have excess, excessive pass-through bandwidth because it doesn't need it because it's electrically isolated, and so you get very different effects when you contend the network. Um, there's topology effects. Abhinav Batelli is a good example. Is, has a bunch of papers on this. You get what we pay for with respect to optimizations. So we tell you know a vendor that we want to buy a machine that does magic all to all, all reduce, B cast, barrier because those are critical path of our our essential codes. Well, we don't really have many codes that hit on reduced scatter, so we get we get sort of what falls out naturally. We see already, actually, the all reduced performance was sort of, you would expect that to potentially be type dependent. Turns out that all gather is, has type dependent performance because one of the optimizations for all gather is to do it over all reduce. And since I showed you that all reduce is type dependent, all gather for short messages is secretly type dependent. So if you cast all your buffers, if, like if you just say, oh, I don't care, I'm just going to cast my doubles to bytes and then multiply by eight in the count you're actually going to take a huge performance hit on BlueGene because for short messages, the all gather is going to go through the all reduce path and go faster when it's doubles. Then there was the whole thing about pre-barrier and collectives. Cray has a hook for this because it matters on their machine. BlueGene doesn't, but I will hope that they will do so soon. And the behavior we saw wasn't, wasn't trivial. So, the, so this is a, the, the code that I worked with, the Gordon Bell Prize people. They, they were running at full scale. And, and their, their Krilov solver took, a, took like a hundred or almost a thousand fold performance hit in the all reduced performance, which led to a 5% total application runtime difference. So 5% end to end application performance was sensitive to the fact that we put a barrier in front of the all reduced to deal with jitter. So uh, this is just a little example if you want to see some protocol effects. So this program will not always deadlock. It should always deadlock from an, or it can, it is entitled to by the MPI standard to always deadlock, but it won't in a couple cases. And so that's your homework. So find the case where it doesn't deadlock and explain why. So you have to change both the buffer size and the proc count. You don't have to, you could do it all on your Mac to see the difference, but it, so that should tell you how, how many procs you, the search space. So lastly, a good MP, MPI implementation is cognizant of all these things. I've not found vendors to be surprised by this weirdness uh, most of the time. And they usually say, well, OK, you've got a weird app that's behaving, that's making my MPI behave strangely, which is sort of punting on blame. But it's also an acceptable thing to do when you're a computer scientist who implements MPI. You say, OK, the application knows better what's doing with MPI than, than we do. So here's some knobs. So one thing about the knobs, the defaults that you'll get on the machine, they're, they're good defaults, but they're, they're, they're oriented towards a couple things. The vendors don't get paid until we accept the machine, and we're going to run with the defaults. So that means that if there's an acceptance test for the machine that is sensitive to some default, they're going to choose the default that makes that thing pass. That's OK. There's nothing wrong with that. And many of those apps are, are sort of big, famous you know, leg, legacy apps, potentially, that are MPI-1. And so you'll find that certain sort of well-behaved MPI applications will run great with the defaults. But if you, for example, use one-sided communication MPI, you will find that you will get terrible performance with the defaults on essentially every machine that I have used. The last bullet is me summarizing all the different knobs that you get on every different MPI implementation and network that allow you to turn that on. Just as an example of if you use one-sided, you have to then put this in your Q subscript as a function of machine. Flow control can, um, we, Madness is an app I'll talk about next week when I come back. We, we see performance irregularities because we're very irregular. Our communication pattern is all over the machine. And it turns out that BlueGene has zone-based flow control. And as soon as you start going long distances, it starts saying, well, I don't know if I'm not going to blast the receiver with flow control issues, so I'm going to be more conservative. So we see sort of scale effects that come from flow control, and, but we know that our communication is sort of balanced enough, we don't sort of bomb on one node all at once, that we can probably turn off this sort of conservative flow control 
But that's, that's something that will sort of come into play at scale. And then eager rendezvous cutoff, you know, you could set the eager buffer to a gigantic value and waste hundreds of gigabytes in buffering on every node, and it may or may not buy you anything. But the, these are, these are space-time trade-offs you could think about. Homework, I'm, I'm not going to be here for the hands-on this evening, but I would, you know, I would strongly recommend people run, you know, one of the standard MPI benchmarks on different machines and just look at the difference. Run, if you see Ethernet, MirrorNet, InfiniBand, you'll see huge differences in latency. You know, look at Cartesian, make a Cartesian communicator and write boundary exchange. Maybe you guys already did that yesterday. And then actually, so here's the link if you want. Don't look at the, uh, the one-sided part of that. It's, it's not ready. But the collectives tester is, is fun. It's easy to build. Um, and it'll just blast on the network and tell you whether or not your collectives are wonky. And then my colleague Vitali has a, we had a paper on, on MPI uh, sort of performance analysis on BG that sort of will show you some more of this stuff in detail. And also there's a bunch of benchmark code described in the paper that you could run. So I, I wanted to talk about MPI because MPI is the best way to get portable performance, but I just added a bunch of caveats to that. And then a sort of fundamental thing. And then Aaron actually asked me or suggested that I do some sort of he wanted to know what my experiences were, sort of doing it right and doing it wrong, or you know what's painful and what's not. So these are two, I'm going to do two case studies, one of which is Elemental. So Elemental is not my project. Jack Poulsen was a very independent intern of mine many years ago. Now he's faculty at Georgia Tech. He's a brilliant guy, and this is all his project, so please give him all the credit. And Elemental is a dense linear algebra library. So it's like Scalapack in some respects, and it's totally not like Scalapack in others. You can see that if you read the code. There's plenty of info online, so I'm not going to tell you about dense linear algebra or what Elemental does. You can look it up. What I'm going to try and talk about is the experience of performance and portability with Elemental. So one of the things that, you know, some people basically their entire world is an x86, Linux, MPI, POSIX, whatever thing. And if, you, if that is the extent of the world you, one you will live in, fine, your portability problems will be, will be insignificant. But, you know, if you want to step outside, even Mac is annoying. Mac has a, is BSD derived and doesn't have the full support for POSIX that Unix or Linux does. So you go in and you do things like non, the pthread, affinity API, sysconf, syscontrol stuff. So even Mac is annoying. But on Mac, when I ported Elemental, there wasn't any work to it. All I did is read the manual because I don't like to think about you know, I want to do L blahs, not Framework Accelerate. Steve Jobs knows better than I do, so what can I say? And, and then I have to learn how to use CMake. So learning how to use the build system is actually turns out the bottleneck. As, um, so, so BGP was many years ago. Jack worked at ALCF. We, had, we found some compiler bugs, and we found some of the MPI quirks that I already mentioned to. It really wasn't a problem. So BlueGNP was actually kind of, actually is harder to deal with than BGQ. BGQ is a much nicer machine to, to, to port to, although BGP isn't bad, um, per, it, unless you do really awful things like fork and you know, TCP. But you know, BlueGeneQ, it took me an entire day to port it. The reason it took me an entire day to port it is because I had to port CMake. And CMake is sort of, it works, but I hate it. And although compared to configure, it's sort of a toss up, who do I hate more? And, uh, but, but once I actually built CMake, then Elemental just drop in, bam, worked. And that was on BlueGene Q in 2011. So that was on a BlueGene Q that was pre-production hardware, pre-production software, MPI wasn't even working, the compilers were all beta, and it didn't, I mean, it didn't even have a scheduler. Okay, so that's, so we were on BlueGene absolute, you know, first whatever after the stuff was existing, and Elemental was bam, just worked on it. And that, that I think that affirms something about Elemental's software quality, which I can only go into so much detail here, you should just read the code for the rest of it. And then I went and I got early access to Edison at NERSC, CrayXE30. Once again, I had a stupid, stupid problem with CMake and detecting the login node G4 trans shared object. And once I, you know, ripped a bunch of my hair out and sweared a bunch and wrote NERSC angry messages about what the hell was wrong with their machine, and we worked around that, then it, Elemental just went. So, and it ran super fast, because Sandy Bridge is great. So immediately here just means, you know, limit, Ray limited by other things. So why is Elemental easy port? So even though I've cursed CMake many, many, many times, it, it, it does capture the details. I'm not endorsing CMake. Uh, I personally prefer Configure. I don't care what you use. Just use a real build system. Don't use a shell script that invokes iFort 
Okay, I've seen that. It's terrible. The first thing I do is rewrite the whole thing. And for supercomputers, CMake has this nice thing called tool chains, which you know configure requires some level of user intelligence that's not always present if you're a developer and you have users that are, say, brilliant scientists and have no idea what they're doing with computers. Configure can be challenging for them. I and mean, not every machine has a package manager. So with Elemental, we have tool chain files that just say like VGQ, Vesta, GNU, SL, CMake. Okay? You probably, if you heard all that, you could parse what that does, and you just say CMake, dot, dot, whatever, CMake toolchain, bam, and you're done, okay? And I wrote that. So I work for ALCF, I know a little bit about BlueGene Q, and that's just in Elemental. So if you could figure out that somebody who knows something about BlueGene put the toolchain in there, you don't have to know anything about what compilers or what libraries, it should all be there. Elemental wraps all of its dependencies, uh, like MPI, Fortran, or all the Fortran libraries, Blas and Laypack, and it handles all the portability issues associated with that inside of those wrappers. So you don't see that. If you have stupid machines that behave badly with respect to these libraries, you can encapsulate that. You know, robust build systems are really important. The other thing you want to do, if you're, if you're, if you actually, you know, if, if you want to be a hero programmer and live in a tower and not open source your code and not use version control, that's your business. But if you want to be serious, you want to, you want to develop a, a community of people who can work on a project with, spe with special skills, you know, it's sort of like all those, you know, action TV shows like, you know, uh, I don't know, the A-Team, like somebody's good at shooting guns and somebody's good at punching people in the face. Like, I'm not good at C++, but I am really good at BlueGene. So my contribution to Elemental is always, when on BlueGene, fill in the blanks, something here, and generally I stay out of the way otherwise. And if you build a good library and you put it on open source and you're nice, good people will line up to help you. So Jack writes 99% of the code, but the 1% of the code that he sort of doesn't do is just sort of dirty, nasty stuff, which he's got a whole bunch of people like me and other, other you know, sort of users of Elemental and facilities people lined up to sort of give him contributions. And because he inlines those, or he, you know, he commits those patches with like 24-hour latency, there's sort of a positive feedback loop. So if you're thinking about becoming a software HPC developer, Think about the sociology of your project and, and how you want to attract good people um, and scare away terrible users. So Elemental, I, we have papers on this. There's, this is just showing, I wanted to show that Elemental is portable, but it's not slow either. Um, this is a generalized eigensolve. I ran this last night. This is 10,000 by 10,000 matrix, and it scales pretty much perfectly from 1 to about 64, and then you sort of hit the the latency limited regime where you're about 10 seconds. You can't do an eigensolve faster unless you've got shared memory or something. You can run Elemental yourself. In general, it's, um, it's going to be competitive with Scalapack. Sometimes it's better, but, but algorithms trump software. So when Scalapack and Elemental do the same algorithm that's optimal, you don't care. There's some interface definition, uh, you know, details that you might care about Fortran versus C++. Elemental puts all of its flops in blahs, so you don't have to, there's no flop tuning of, of Elemental, which, you know, if you can't use Blas, well, then you're, you have a different problem. Elemental, unlike other libraries, is basically putting its entire burden for communication on MPI collectives. Scalapack has its own sort of hand-rolled collectives on top of point-to-point, -point, which assume a 2D process grid. While a five-dimensional torus is not a very good representation of a 2D grid, whereas if you have an MPI all-to-all -all V on a 5D torus and you've got BlueGene contention, resolution, all these things, it'll run, run really nicely. So when you're communication limited regime, regime, you're using collectives on a good machine, Elemental runs really well. Elemental makes use of subcommunicators in a topology friendly way. Doesn't mean it's topology aware, it doesn't, it doesn't go in and probe the hardware uh, coordinates, but it sets things up so that MPI is smart, it'll do well. And all the tuning parameters are you know, either in your code or runtime and not deep inside the library is some pound to find that you have to dig for and change seven different places to the same value, otherwise your code seg faults. Other libraries do that. The last element of performance is, of course, productivity. This is elemental code. I think it's, I think it's pretty. Basically, you declare a bunch of things. You encapsulate all of the MPI business right here. You establish a grid based on a communicator. Elemental goes in and figure out what's going on with that communicator, sets everything up, and then you instantiate distributed matrices on that grid, and then you declare some stuff, and then you say what you're solving, and then there is only one function call after you, I mean, this is sort of generic to, when you, to your job, and then here's your function call, Hermitian generalized definite eigensolve. That's it, no, no, uh, no horrible interface at all. 
So if you don't, you know, if you're using Fortran, there's Fortran bindings aren't, you know, not going to be fun with this. But anyways, so this is good stuff in my opinion. It's easy to use, and you'll get portable performance. One of the things about this that was one of the points that I didn't have time to sort of generate a huge amount of content on. It, there's no MPI calls. How many, of, how many of you know where the all to all V happens or the all gather? You don't see that, right? So one of the elements of portable performance is abstracting away details like communication behind data structures and methods. So this is good old-fashioned object-oriented programming 101, but because Elemental only exposes to you a, a sort of abstract object for your, your network and then, ab, you know, Data, distributed data structures with methods associated with them, you really can hide a whole bunch of details. If you have to sort of manually set up your own block cyclic grid, do all your memory allocation, and instantiate that all in a Fortran 77 common block, you're, you're obviously playing with fire because you have to get everything right on your own. So I've got about 10 minutes left. So I'm going to talk a little bit about NWChem. I can't do NWChem justice, but um, I think I can cover the high-level bits. NWChem is older than MPI, and this is really, really an essential detail because had it not been, a lot of things would probably be different. And NWChem still, for whatever reason, that I, and I object to all of them, refuses to assume that MPI always exists. And if it did that, all of its, all, essentially all of its portability problems would disappear. But, so this is capturing some of the things from my elders. One of the things NWChem did at the time in the early 90s was they tried to reuse existing code that had been written for vector machines and sort of non-distributed architectures that were in HPC at the time. And that was pretty much a waste of time. Basically, they were all, people back then weren't developing good reusable software. It was all Fortran. Their, you know, version control build systems were like state-of-the-art novel. Who knows if this, you know, you can look around, like look around at what the, the de facto build system and version control was in 1992 and actually Figure out how people transmitted code to each other. Um, I don't think they were using tape cassettes, but you know there'd be like anonymous FTP over you know a modem that would actually bang at you and st stuff like that. So life was different. NWChem was designed to be object oriented, but implemented in Fortran 77, and that's kind of funny because Fortran 77 is not an or object oriented language, so you get no language support. But they still tried to design it uh, in an effective way. The reason they did that is because C C++ was was really DOA as a performance thing back then. It was the compilers were not optimized. You could not assume any level of effective performance out of the abstractions that you were given. You know, fast forward 20 years, C++ compilers are really, really quite good at optimization. And if you can find a case where Fortran is faster than C or C++, it's probably programmer error. Global Arrays was a programming model they used. I'll pr I may talk about that next week. One of the things that it did is that it, 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 like Elemental, it abstracted away the explicit communication to something that was data oriented. So Global Arrays sounds like it's probably doing distributed arrays, distributed matrices, and then has methods associated with them that allow you to not talk to processes. You're just talking to the data structure. You're saying, I need that portion of the distributed data. You give it to me. I don't care how that happens. And that's an abstraction that, that proved extremely productive and has been performant all the way up to, you know, basically petaflop 100,000 cores, although it gets, it gets a little bit hairy. NWChem has basically non-portable bits in only two places, uh, one of which is the communication substrate ARMC inside of Global Rays, which is a separate project. And the others, they stick in source util. And source util is a collection of all sorts of archaic ugliness that has existed, working around, you know, things like Cray, oper you know, Cray Unicos operating systems had this thing being eight bytes instead of four bytes. I mean, stuff that I guess some of you are as old as I am, but, but if you are like, if you're in your 20s, you can, it's like going through a museum because these are machines that have been, they, that are in museums that are being supported and all the nastiness associated with them that thank God uh, Linux and POSIX for the most part have taken care of. NWChem had to roll its own. It's using F77, you probably know it doesn't have a dynamic memory allocator, which is a showstopper for some things. It has its own IO substrate, has its own runtime database, checkpoint restart. It hooks all the resource managers. It tells you how, so all this stuff is non-portable. It hooks all the timers. They didn't just use MPIW time because it didn't exist. So NWChem had to sort of implement its own standard library type collection of interfaces to everything, the vast majority of which are actually all captured in MPI in a very nice way, such that if you went in and just said, we assume MPI, you delete all your non-portable timers, you, you could delete your 
non-POSIX IO layer. You can even use the MPI dynamic memory allocator if you want, things like that. So if you want to port NWCAM, and I, porting NWCAM is the hardest thing that I do basically every year, but thank God it's gotten a whole lot easier. So the first thing one has to do is port ARMC. That's like porting MPI, but probably easier because of smaller functions and it doesn't have a detailed spec that you have to comply with exactly for all cases. This is really hard. So when I got on BGP, I had to wait a year for ARMC because IBM and PNNL had to work together to put it together. There was no op, there was no like really slow portable alternative at the time for a variety of reasons. So that's, that's a huge bottleneck. You don't even start talking about NWCAM until you can run ARMC and then you can run global res. There's a whole bunch of amazing, Fortran is the most non-portable portable, portable programming language I have ever seen. I cannot tell you how many piece of junk bugs I have found that are solely the result of Fortran not having a reasonable set of semantics about like things like, you know, why should the why not just pick an integer size or at least decide what the integer size might be and stick with it, make it interoperable, maybe support unsigned integers, who knows. XLF, which is IBM's Fortran compiler, doesn't have a doesn't have a proper preprocessor, so NWCAM has to work around that. That's a hilarious. Work around a lot of operating system quirks that don't matter. Yeah, I, I don't, if you wanna, you know, wait till next year and buy me some beer and then maybe we can talk about terrible Fortran integer things that make my life awful. Anyways, so today, thank, thanks to POSIX and everything else, the only thing hard about NWCAM is ARMC, but we have more on that. So I gotta finish up pretty quick. NWCAM runs everywhere. The only machines I can't run it on are Cycortex and iPhone. Business model says, you know, maybe maybe the not running NWCAM is a is an economic failure some of the time, if you're not a phone. So I'm going to so talk about the RMC problem, and because I'm talking about portable communication, you can always use TCP/IP, except when BlueJean doesn't support TCP/IP. So okay, so there's a MPI-based implementations, but they both use send receive, which one-sided over two-sided, two-sided over one-sided. You can make arguments about, but it's, it's just not a good idea to do, if you have an RDMA network, to do one-sided over two-sided. But, and one of them used Spawn, which didn't support on BlueJean. So again, not available. So they, there's, there's a send receive plus threads implementation that works. I don't try it because I don't want to use two-sided for one-sided. So uh, there's a postdoc who wor worked at Argon until recently, a good friend of mine named J Jim Dynan, who wrote ARMC MPI. And ARMC MPI is a completely ground up rewrite of ARMC that is all like, Naturally, he works for the MPI group, MPitch group, or worked, and so he was a big fan of MPI and its portability and all its cleanliness uh, from software standpoint. So he said, I'm just gonna use MPI for everything. And he did that, and he worked very hard, and he got a nice mapping, and now we have ARMC over MPI one-sided, and also we've essentially gotten rid of anything that isn't MPI-isms. Now, MPI has its own shortcomings for one-sided, as an implementation detail. MPI2 lacked atomics and some other things, but that's all fixed. So I'm gonna real quick, so this shows you, so the nice thing about ARMC MPI is there is no ARMC porting. If the machine comes with MPI installed, which it will, you're, you're ready to go on day one, and you pay a little bit of a performance hit. So InfiniBand is highly optimized ARMC, and we lose by as much of a factor of two, but the Ooster out performance is great, I, it works. It actually turns out that if you scale far enough, ours will scale better because it stops, it doesn't crash. This is XT, this is highly optimized again. Why they're scaling this tiny problem size out to 12,000 cores is beyond me, but again, we lose a little bit once we're in the strong scaling regime where latency matters. This is BlueGene P, this made me very happy. ARMC was crashing above one rack on BGP. I think it's actually a hardware deadlock issue. I've never resolved it. I just started using MP ARMC MPI, and I paid a little bit of a performance hit, but it always worked, and it scaled to four racks. So I got, I could basically make up the difference with more processors. And then here's a good example. Turns out, for whatever reason, that ARMC, even though it's a low-level device port on the on Gemini network, MPI was actually faster. And that has to do with the fact that vendors put a lot of effort into MPI, and they often do a good job. So this is actually, Nate, the blue, the blue, uh, the, the solid line is the bottom is MPI, it's winning. So anyways, not a big deal, this is all in a paper. So it took me zero effort to port Global Rays to BlueJean Q because I just had MPI, it just worked. I did it in one afternoon at Supercomputing, we put it up on a slide deck the next day. 
It took me three hours to deal with the Fortran cruft. I had to excise a bunch of libraries because of, again, more Fortran garbage. And there's a voodoo C bug that we found. It, it's the weirdest bug I've ever seen in my entire life. We just replaced it with Fortran. There was way too much pointer arithmetic in the C code, and I think something went terribly wrong. So NWChem now at this point is portable. It runs on a, uh, BGQ, but we have a lot of performance stuff to deal with. NWChem is a process-based code. It, it's not, it doesn't have any threading in it, uh, but it's memory limited. So you take MPI all the way out, the, populate the node with 64 MPI ranks. You get about 200 megabytes per process and NWChem can't do anything. So you have to f do use fewer PPN, and now you're giving up execution resources for memory. So yeah, you need threads, except that GARMC isn't, as far as I know, thread safe. It's not documented to be thread safe. So you have to be fork joint. So that's sort of a, gonna hit an Omdahl wall. Common blocks in Fortran aren't safe, thread safe. So again, you have to be very careful with your OpenMP to make sure you never touch a common block variable. And then uh, IBM didn't give give me all the magic that I wanted in our RMA, and so I need to make it faster with using pen. But at least, the, the nice thing about this, this is the problem you want, which is the code runs in one day, and then you spend the rest of your time optimizing. If you spend one year making the code run, you'll be so tired and so annoyed, you probably won't have that much energy left to optimize. So this is sort of, I think, an essential part of what we want to achieve in HPC. So I think Aaron asked me if I, how I would port NWChem to accelerators and such like that. So the good news is quantum chemistry is flop rich. Some of the stuff we run actually is easier to run, like easier to scale than, than Linpack. So it's, it's sort of cheating. It's really, we have to get vectorization, fine-grained parallelism. This is universal. There's absolutely no app that I know about that does floating point that shouldn't be thinking about vectorization and threading. And the guys who are talking next, I hope will go into great deal, detail about this. So we have part of the code running on mic or multi-core. Some of the kernels run on mic, but I don't have the full setup yet. But we're now, we went from being MPI only, I added a bunch of OpenMP, and we now actually break even or win a little bit in hybrid mode. So this is nice because we now get you know, four or eight gigabytes to ourselves per process. We can weak scale really nicely. Um, the mic kernels are scaling to more than 100 threads. I could talk maybe next time about OpenMP and how we did that, but it's, it's just loops. You just have to use MPI, OpenMP correctly. And then maybe a question that I might get asked, which is, would I rather do GPU or mic, having done both of them? And when we did GPU code, uh, we, we actually rewrote the entire code from scratch. We did not do NWChem. We took a loop-based C code, and we engineered it all the way from CUDA 1.1 up to the modern day. And that, that was fun, and it was a lot of work, but it only runs on a workstation. And on the mic stuff, I just add a bunch of pragma, whatever, and it'll, and it'll offload once the code is refactored. So it depends on what you want out of life. I certainly am very happy with CUDA, but that's because I really, really like writing code. Um, and actually, I don't really care how much science I do most of the time. So if you care about science more than code, you probably want to think differently about your uh, workload. One thing, if you want to do some homework, I'm sure you guys have lots and lots of free time and you're not tired, you have tons of energy at the end of every day. You can do, do some Googling or just measure it and figure out sort of what the DGEM flop rate is on a given accelerator and, and then what the PCI bandwidth is and figure out where the trade-off is. At what point do you actually get a benefit from moving the data across the bus? Then do that for something more interesting than DGEM, like your own, your own science codes. I would in terms of performance portability, run OpenMP loop kernels on BlueGene and run them on Intel, especially as you run threads across multiple sockets. And notice that there's a huge difference. Go from one to 64 threads on BGQ and try to go one to as many threads as there are hardware threads on a Sandy Bridge box and, and see, if, see if the lines are, are similarly straight. And then the other one I would do just for fun is write, write, write a simple vector kernel in, in different languages with different features and then compile it and then you know, either look at the assembly dump or look at the performance and try and think about, okay, are which languages and which features of your code are more friendly to vectorization? Because that's, vectorization is really hard to do by hand and there is no real good portable way to do it, so how would you actually achieve that in your code?